The second part of this talk, we're going to look at the radar data associated with this event. And, um, you know, we kind of thought that, you know, uh, you'd think going into an event like this, uh, where if you knew you were going to see seven tornadoes, including several uh, long track tornadoes, that the, uh, the radar um, signatures that we would see on this event might be pretty classic as far as, uh, you know, what our training has indicated that we often see with tornadoes. And uh, you'll see from this talk that there, there were some uh, classic as aspects of the radar imagery for this event. But uh, overall, um, some of the things that we saw surprised us a little bit, um, in particular with the strength of the, uh, of the uh, rotation that we were seeing on some of our radar imagery. It turned out to be a little bit weaker than what we often see with uh, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, and that kind of surprised us a little bit. So uh, some interesting aspects overall with the, uh, with the radar uh, imagery from this event and some things that made it a little bit more of a difficult type event than, uh, than we thought it, it might be. Okay, all right, so this, this slide here is just a quick outline of what I'm going to show. Um, just a brief overview of, uh, of reflectivity with some conceptual models that may or may not have worked well for this event. Then I'm going to show you uh, rotational velocity which is typically when we're issuing tornado warnings here, uh, that's what we really like to key on normally, is the amount of rotational velocity we see in our Doppler uh, radar. And then we're going to look at, uh, we're going to dust off uh, spectrum width, which is something that we also looked at for this event. And then finally, uh, we'll look at, uh, very briefly at some new uh, dual polarization variables and what they look like for the event. Okay, so I got my next slide here. Um, and a couple of the, a few of the tornadoes that we're really going to focus on for this event were the ones that were sort of at the beginning of the event that occurred across southern New York. So my slide here in the uh, upper left, or on the left, shows the uh, tracks of these tornadoes. And then the one on the right is kind of a zoom in of the one that went right through the, uh, the town of Elmira. You can see it went right through the downtown area and kind of tracked uh, right along the river valley here. Um, and actually... Looking at a little more closely at, at some of these uh, tornado tracks, we found that tornadoes in this area often are, uh, are tied to terrain. They often follow terrain features, and they often um, develop in river valleys where low-level flow can be channeled and sometimes backed. And it uh, looks like that may have been the case for a couple of these storms as well. Okay, so uh, here's just a quick uh, look at some pictures from the, uh, the damage um, in Elmira. I mean, it wasn't devastating damage. There were no fatalities or anything, uh, thankfully, but a uh, fair amount of structural damage as the storm went through, um, you know, this, this small city. Okay, and again, this is a slide that I showed uh, in the last presentation, just kind of giving you an overview of what happened. Um, storms developed kind of in a broken line across the area, across central New York and northern Pennsylvania, and then progressed eastward. Um, there were some bookend vortex type signatures that you can see there in the, in the right-hand slide, and also some Boeing features. And so one thing we kind of expected to see with a kind of a linear kind of a, a system like this, if we were expecting to see tornadoes, we, we kind of thought that one thing that we might see is the broken S signature, where we see um, a line develop and then you see a break in the line. And this is kind of a, this is just the broken S conceptual model that we were thinking that we might see for this event. There, the slide on the left and then the zoom in on the right kind of shows this break in the line and you get a tornado in, in the break. Uh, but then what you'll see um, in this case we really didn't see that very well. What we actually had is we actually had a, an HP supercell that developed on the northern edge of the line. You can see there was a, a very pronounced inflow notch that developed on the northern edge of that HP supercell. And that's where the tornado actually uh, actually formed was in that inflow notch. So we'll look at it one more time. So it was not a broken S, and that kind of took us by surprise. It was more like an HP supercell that developed on the north end of the line with a tornado developing in the inflow notch. Now we'll go ahead and we'll progress uh, to the next tornado. We'll keep going. This is reflectivity, right, with the third and fourth tornado. And again, you can see, as you go ahead again, kind of page forward, a second tornado developed on the south southern part of the HP supercell, and then a third tornado developed. A uh, second uh, tornado developed, moved east across Elmira, and then the third tornado developed moved e and uh, moved further east. And uh, just kind of an interesting little feature here. We'll go forward. Um, that's when the tornado was just to the uh, west of Elmira. And one thing that was of a little bit of interest here, you can see right along the track, 
there was a very small, looks like a little uh, beware that developed that you could actually see um, with that tornado as it was tracking east. You're at about maybe 3,500 to 4,000 feet off the ground right there uh, with the radar to the east at this time. So just kind of an interesting little feature that seemed to develop with that storm that was very small, but it looks like you can, you can really see it there. And now we're looking at rotational velocity through the first tornado, this rotational couplet that, that developed with the first tornado. And then again, you can kind of go back and forward a couple times, and you can see that there was rotation that developed kind of in that inflow notch. And actually, there were sort of two little areas of, tornado, of uh, rotation. The second little area to the south there at the end was associated with a very brief tornado touchdown that occurred. But the primary tornado here occurred with the northern rotational center, and I'll tell you, from, from our point of view, the rotation there is, it's evident that there's some rotation, but it was not particularly strong at that time. We like to see usually a little bit, uh, little bit more pronounced rotational couplets with the tornadoes that we see in our area. We're going to show uh, sort of a, a, a 3D look at how the, the uh, rotation developed using the GR2 analyst for this case. Blue is, is uh, normalized rotation on the GR2 analyst. And you can see this is the, ro the normalized rotation prior to tornado touchdown. You can see it's all pretty much focused in the, in the low levels. You can see it kind of developing upward in time prior to the tornado touchdown. And then right there is the tornado, and you, you can see the uh, rotation again sort of starting at low levels and then spinning upward as the, uh, as the tornado developed and, and, uh, and moved east. And I think that's going to show rotational velocity for the Elmira tornado. You can see it developed... Uh, well southwest of Elmira, kind of on the, uh, the leading edge of a, of a rear flank downdraft that was uh, speeding eastward across southern New York. Very strong straight line winds associated with that, that Boeing gusting uh, rear flank downdraft. And then you can see a little rotational couplet developing on the leading edge of the, of the, uh, of the downdraft. And that progresses eastward across Elmira as an EF-1 tornado. Again, rotational velocity is evident there, but not as strong as we'd like to see for a, a, a tornado usually. And then that progresses eastward. Another tornado develops even a little bit further east, again, on a rotational couplet, but not the strongest rotational couplet you'll ever see. It starts out with a little rotational couplet on the rear flank downdraft. It strengthens a little bit and moves through Elmira, and then a, uh, eventually another tornado develops in association with the couplet and moves off to the east. Now we'll go on and we'll look at the uh, rot normalized rotation in 3D again. Now unfortunately here, uh, of course, Murphy's Law, we, had, uh, we were missing the data from the time when the rotation first started with this tornado. So I'm not sure if it started at low levels and then spun up or if it was deep throughout its life cycle. But you can see here when it's just west of Elmira, you can see it's a fairly deep albeit not all that strong, but a fairly deep area of rotation. And then as you go forward in time, you can see that area of rotation just kind of persisted and uh, moved east across uh, Shimon County and across Elmira. Would have been nice to see if we had had the, uh, from one scan earlier, if we had seen if it, like the first tornado, if it had kind of spun up from the ground up, which you might expect from a QLCS type uh, development. But uh, in this case, anyway, it looked like uh, just a fairly deep area of, of modest rotation moving through Elmira. So, like I said, a lot of the, the rotational velocities that we were seeing with this case were not particularly strong for what we like to see for tornadoes in our area. What this chart shows right here, it's got environmental 0 to 1 kilometer, kilometer storm element of felicity on the x-axis, and then observed um, radar uh, indicated rotational velocity on the y-axis. The blue uh, diamonds in this uh, chart are, are observed tornadoes. And the red triangles are events where we had a tornado warning out, but no tornado occurred. So you can see mostly we issue tornado warnings when uh, rotational velocity increases to greater than about 25 knots. But you can see we get a lot of no uh, busted tornado warnings when the uh, 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicities are less than about 150. But when we get the rotational velocity greater than 25 knots and uh, along with the, uh, st the good uh, rotational velocity of greater than 25, that's where we mostly get our tornadoes. Now, the 0 to 1 kilometer helicity for this case was right around 150. So we would expect maybe to see tornadoes when the rotational velocity uh, gets, gets to be greater than about 25 knots. 
And this chart shows uh, sort of tracks the rotational velocity for these cases prior to and during tornado touchdown. The red line there indicates the lowest elevation scan of about 0.5 degrees. Uh, the green line is 0.9 degrees, and the purple line is 1.3. And you can see for the first tornado, uh, the rotational velocity barely made it to 25 knots prior to and during tornado touchdown. And there was really no, no real big increase in rotational velocity just prior to tornado touchdowns. And the next slide shows the data for the next two tornadoes. The first tornado on the left is the tornado that hit Elmira. And at least in this case, you can see at 0.5 degrees, the rotational velocity did spike up to about 30 knots just prior to tornado touchdown. The second tornado also looked like the rotational velocity was in a general increasing trend prior to tornado touchdown. But again, the bottom line is here, these rotational values, other than maybe the 30 knots just at the beginning of the Elmira event, really not particularly impressive for something that we're calling a quote-unquote major tornado outbreak. I mean, it would have been nice if we had seen values maybe up into the 40s. The fact that we barely saw 30 and mostly we're seeing values in the 20s was, you know, maybe a little bit disturbing to us. We would like to have seen more rotation. So we thought, okay, well, maybe, uh, maybe we're looking at, maybe we can look at something else that could have kind of helped us here since the rotation was kind of marginal. So we dusted off uh, a parameter called spectrum width. Uh, when I say dusted it off, I mean that often, I would have to say that you know, uh, typically in our office we have not historically looked a lot at spectrum width during severe and potentially tornadic events in, uh, in our CWA. But we decided, hey, what the heck, you know, let's, uh, beggars can't be choosers, let's try it for this event. So yeah, we'll look at the spectrum width uh, loop here for the first tornado. And you can see spectrum width is, is, is quite a noisy parameter. That's one reason why it hasn't often... Uh, gone uh, into a lot of favor uh, for, our, for our office. You can see some values of spectrum width during the event, uh, maybe spiking up near uh, about 20 prior to the first tornado touchdown and about 15 uh, with the second tornado touchdown. So it is at least encouraging that you can see some maxima of spectrum width developing on the leading edge of the line with these tornadoes. But again, you can see it's, it's quite a noisy parameter and you can see some other maxima of spectrum width kind of scattered around here and there. And the next slide is going to show the same thing except for the Elmira tornado and then the one that was further east. And we'll go ahead and loop that forward. And uh, it looked like for the Elmira tornado, spectrum width really did spike up uh, nicely uh, prior to uh, the storm moving through Elmira. And then a little bit of a spike there with the second tornado. And you can see uh, the value actually spiked all the way up to uh, 27 just prior to the tornado moving through Elmira. And just, just again, a review of spectrum width. Spectrum width is sort of an, as a, uh, a measure of the amount of noise that you're getting in the velocity signature. So you'd expect high values of spectrum width possibly with tornadoes. Some previous research on tornadoes done in other parts of the country. This is from a, a paper that I think is about 10 years old now. Um, but it showed, uh, the, it gave the idea that spectrum width often does pulse upward in cells uh, just prior to and during tornado touchdown. The uh, basic idea of this, of this plot here, I guess actually this, this, this isn't that old of a paper, but the idea is that this, from this chart, is that the tornado spiked up, or the spectrum width spiked up to a value of around 20 right around the time of tornado touchdown. So using a, uh, a value then of around uh, maybe 20, based on this research anyway, as maybe a threshold for, for tornadoes. And so I said, all right, let's go ahead and plot uh, these tornadoes then and see if that threshold of around 20 worked out pretty well. And it worked out pretty well for the first tornado. You can see we spiked up to just around 20, just, uh, just at tornado touchdown time. And uh, lo and behold, it worked uh, pretty well for the, for, the, uh, for the next tornado too. You can see it spiked up to around 20 right at tornado touchdown, got all the way up to about 27. And then uh, toward the end of the event, it, it did drop down below 20. So the overall, the overall idea that a threshold of around 20 for spectrum width for tornadoes looks like it may have worked out fairly well for, for our case today. Although, again, uh, spectrum width it can be a little bit of a hard sell at times to uh, forecasters because it can be a little bit of a, a, a noisy feature on radar. And the last thing I wanted to show here was uh, some work with uh, dual polarization um, radar. We all, uh, at least uh, here in the uh, U.S. Uh, National Weather Service, we've all uh, 
Our radars have all gone to dual polarization over the last year or so, and we all got some training on uh, dual polarization radar, how to use it, how to, how to interpret it uh, for potential severe weather. And for tornadoes, there didn't seem to be a lot of utility for it. Um, it, was, it was the ZDR and KDP values could be used, and the CC values. Uh, we got a lot of training on that when it came down to hail. As far as tornadoes, the main thing that we got out of it was that you can use, you can identify debris balls with uh, very low circular areas of uh, correlation coefficient. But again, this tornado was quite far away from our, or these tornadoes were generally quite far away from our radar. And so maybe not surprisingly, we didn't see any debris balls with them on the, uh, the CC parameter. But I did notice this, uh, this paper, uh, actually a couple of papers that were recently written by some authors who looked at some supercellular tornadoes in the uh, Midwest and South. And uh, you can see the image there on the left. They were looking at for something for, tor for uh, tornadoes, something called a ZDR arc, where they saw a, uh, an area of enhanced ZDR as indicated by large drops kind of arcing around the inflow part of the storm. And then, and, the, and that's indicated on that, that chart on the right, on the left there, as that pink arc sort of around the inflow of the supercell. And then the green area behind it is an area they're calling the enhanced KDP foot. And, and uh, they, they, in their research, they believe that that's an area of small drops. And so it, during tornadic storms, they, they claim that what they've seen is that the KDP foot becomes separate from the ZDR arc. And that, what, what that's an indication of, that's an indication of, of, of localized strong shear associated with a possible tornadic circulation or the supercellular circulation, which is causing a, a separation in between the large drops associated with the high ZDRs and the small drops associated with the high KDPs. So they're sort of saying that, to, to, that a tornadic signature then in the dual pole radar with these storms might be... A, a separation between the high ZDR, ZDR arc, um, which sort of takes up residence on the over near the inflow of the storm, and the KDP foot, or high KDP, which kind of gets pushed back to the back of the storm. And so we'll go ahead and we'll look, uh, I, I decided what the heck, we'll go ahead and look at that for uh, our storm. Again, this kind of shows what the reflectivity looked like. The next shot kind of looks at what the ZDR looked like, and you, it looked like, uh, and then the next one looks like what the KDP looks like. So let's go back to the one, one and go back and look at the ZDR. And uh, again, um, one of the things that they said to look for here was a, an arc of high ZDR right along the inflow of the storm, and it looks like we, we may have been seeing that here. Uh, and again, this was just uh, prior to the storm uh, reaching Elmira, so this is right around uh, tornado touchdown time. And then we'll go forward, and we'll see that the KDP max appears to be uh, offset from the ZDR arc a little bit back toward the rear of the storm in this case. I think there may be some complications in this case because I think some of that high KDP may not necessarily be small drops, but it might have been, there may have been some hail uh, mixed in with the small drops there. So I'm not sure uh, if that may have been a complication or not. Again, this is something that we're just starting to uh, take a look at. But again, the, the basic idea, let's sort of toggle back and forth between the last two slides, that the ZDR arc appears to be offset from the KDP maximum. And that kind of matches the uh, research, you know, some of the, the recent research in this area. So, you know, like I said, this is the first storm that we've ever looked at this stuff on in, in our area. We're going to need to get some experience with it. But uh, it was interesting that some of, the, some of the features that were shown in some of that fairly recent research did appear to show up for this case as well. And I think this is pretty much my last slide here. This is just a summary. So, uh, again, we started out this event thinking that if we were going to get tornadoes, it was kind of a convective line. We might see the, uh, the broken S signature. But this really didn't seem to be a broken S. It seemed to be more an example of a case of, a, uh, of an HP supercell that kind of developed on the northern edge, uh, northern part of a convective line. The rotational velocities observed on our radar were uh, near the low end of what has historically been observed with tornadoes in this area. So uh, that was a little bit uh, disappointing to us, given that this was such a significant event for us. We would have liked to have seen some stronger rotation. We saw some pretty marginal rotation. It did appear that this, the rotation associated with the Steuben County storm developed at low levels 
Actually, that, that probably isn't right. It says developed at low levels and mid-levels simultaneously. Actually, it looked like from that loop that it looked like it developed at, at lower levels uh, first and then kind of spun up into the mid-levels. It did seem that, that spectrum width would have had some utility in this case, using a threshold of about 20 knots for our uh, two primary tornadoes. Again, uh, spectrum width at times can be a little bit of a hard sell because it can be kind of a noisy field. And then, um, you know, getting out there a little ways, we were looking at some of this dual pole data, and it does look like we saw some similarities between the, uh, the, the some of the signatures that we saw with the ZDR arc and the KDP foot for this storm. Uh, there were some similarities between this storm and some uh, some previous research. And we have been in touch with one of the one of the researchers that's that's looked at some of that stuff, and uh, we're going to be looking this year to see if that that signature um, shows up in, in some other cases that we see uh, hopefully later this year. So I think with that, I'm pretty much done. Um, I'll take any questions at this time. Yeah, I got a question here in Edmonton. Yeah. Um, just for the rotational velocities that you saw with this, um, like, it seems like the vorticity would be a function of both the rotational velocity and the width of rotation. So is it possible that the reason you were seeing tornadoes with these smaller rotational velocities is because you had tighter couplets? Um, well, the, the rotational values that we looked at there were over a, uh, a distance of 1.5 nautical miles. Um, just I probably didn't make that clear when I was talking about values of 25 and 30 and, and all that. It, it looked to us like the the rotation that we were seeing was not only not only was it not all that strong, but it, it did seem to be spread out over a slightly larger distance than what we often see too. We have like a saying the forecasters like to use here is we like to see the rotation uh, bright and tight, you know, for uh, for tornadoes in our area. And I think we found um, over the last probably five to ten years as we look into it more that yeah, the, the old bright and tight rule uh, maybe works out sometimes, but you're going to definitely miss some tornadoes if you, if you only look for uh, bright and tight. And I think this was definitely a case for that. One thing that, that made looking at rotational velocity a, a little sketchy in this case is that these storms were about anywhere from about 40 to 70 miles from the radar. So we were looking at them probably at elevations of about three to 6,000 feet above the ground. And so it may, have, may just be that the rotation would have been a lot better if we could have looked at it at a lower altitude. You know, we were kind of looking really up into almost the mid-levels of the storm there. Thanks a lot. Okay. Mike, it's Dave Sills here in Toronto. Yes. Uh, nice case study. Um, with these line echo wave pattern type of, uh, of, of convective modes, it's, it's uh, difficult because you've got both uh, supercells that can occur and bow echoes. And you've, you've really focused on the supercell part of it, but didn't mention bow echoes too much. And I, you, you were talked about it being an RFD, but I, when I'm looking at it, I see um, I, I see evidence for a bow echo there with a nice rear inflow notch and in fact the the rotation that you're seeing might be associated with the northern bookend vortex which would explain why it's uh, lower intensity than you'd expect with a supercell as a cyclone so just wondered if you if you thought about that just looking from at it from a different perspective yeah you know we uh, when this case first occurred and we were first going into our mode of taking a look at it and and figuring out what to call it we had lots of arguments over whether like you said was that a bookend, what we were looking at there, are we looking at an HP supercell? Are we looking at a bookend vortex? Are we looking, you know, was, you know what was the evidence for a uh, rear inflow jet? I mean, I think that's, that's one thing that made this case a little bit difficult for us, is that it was, kind of, it was kind of difficult to classify. You know, it wasn't a nice, it clearly was not a nice isolated HP supercell, especially looking at that good inflow notch on the northern side of it kind of made it look like a, a bookend vortex in some ways. And so I think, you know, operationally, uh, we, we struggled with it a little bit in real time because we were trying to use conceptual models to try to say, well, what is that thing? In some sense, it, 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 it did have uh, characteristics of a bow echo and that the... Uh, especially on the south side of it, that appeared to be bowing out as it was moving uh, along the New York-Pennsylvania border. That rotation on the north side kind of made it, you know, looked like, kind of like a, uh, a bookend vortex. And then there were also some supercellular aspects of it, too. So um, I think, uh, you know, what to, what to call this, what to classify it as, was, uh, was a real challenge, and, uh, and it, may have, uh, it may have 
caused us some some headaches, especially looking at it in real time. Um, I will say well, one last uh, kind of comment here is that we did issue a tornado warning out on this storm in real time. We got good lead time, and we uh, you know we slapped ourselves on the back and said, hey, we did a great job with it. But um, looking back at it after the fact, there were several forecasters in our office who commented that they didn't know if they would have put a real a, a tornado warning out on it in real time. And I think the, the the guy that actually did put the warning out on it actually kind of admitted after the fact that the main reason he put the warning out on it was that he was pretty confident that, that there was going to be strong, very unusually strong straight-line winds with it, and he knew it was heading right into Corning and Elmira, and so he said he knew there was going to be lots of damage. He wasn't sure if it was going to be a tornado or not, but he knew just the fact that there was going to be so much, he was expecting so much damage kind of prompted him to put the uh, tornado warning out. So he did that as much as any actual rotational uh, signatures that he saw on the radar. So uh, I think we got maybe got a little bit lucky <laughs> in that we had a tornado warning out for this, this case. It was, a, it was a really interesting case, and as far as classifying it, you know, as you were kind of saying there, Dave, uh, uh, kind of a difficult type of a storm to even classify in many ways. Great. Thanks for the, the uh, answer there.